Can I be honest? I don't really know much about the Alamo. Well, that's fair enough. Not many people outside America, or outside Texas even. I was going to say, it's always been one of those sort of Texan things where they say, remember the Alamo? And I remember looking at the Wikipedia page. It was like, yeah, 200 people died. And I'm like, Mm. I'm from Europe. Millions of people died. (laughs) (laughs) So to all Americans out there and Texans, uh, most people in the world don't know no. Actually, what happened? What went down at the Alamo? No. I assume it was some um, sort of famous last stand. Exactly. Which, don't get me wrong; is a very notable thing, um, but it, it's of such small scale, it doesn't seem to have much bearing on things. But maybe I, I just don't know. Um, so small scale, yes. Not having much bearing on things, no. Right. Okay. So it had massive significance, okay. despite like almost completely, regardless of how small yeah. the numbers are, and the numbers are small mm. compared to the American Civil War or the Napoleonic War. It's tiny. Mm. It's absolutely tiny. I'm not trying to be contemptuous either. No, right. It's not. I, it's just that when it's like okay, 200 people died here or whatever. It's like, hey. Yeah. But the significance of it is massive, right? Uh, and uh, so I want to tell the story of the Alamo, but actually. Won't spend a massive amount of time on the Alamo itself, mm-hmm. but talk about before and after. So, okay. in other words, why the Alamo is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did speak to mention it to two, three people uh, uh, an Aussie, a Brit, and an Irishman. And all of them were like, what's, they'd never even heard of the Alamo, really? let alone what actually happened. Right. Okay. So, there you go. In different countries, mm. you have different mythologies grow up that are important to your sort of national identity. I bet the average Californian couldn't tell you anything about it. Yeah, I think outside of Texas or the mm. South, mm. probably. Well, yeah, may may not know. So, as I understand, it was something to do with Texan independence, or something? that's it. That's it. So, this yeah. story is of the Texan Revolution, right? And don't uh, worry, I'm all for Texan independence if they want it. You know, <laughs> of of 1835 <laughs> to 36. Um, so that's the story. So, okay, so to jump straight into <clears throat> Texas is a sort of a special state. Mm. It's um, they all think they're sort of special and quite rightly because in a way each state is almost like a country yeah i've yeah. said that before I've, I've been to texas and i i actually do kind of support this idea that texas is kind of special in the united states they are a bit different to the rest of them and in a positive way as well. i really like yeah. Texas. the lone star state mm. everything's big in texas from the yeah. skies to the prairies to the cars to the, the people everything's bigger but the people were all really nice mm. like i i I, mm. ever, I met dozens and dozens of people they're all very kind and not just people who knew me either just randos, you know, they're just very, very well, well-mannered people. Yeah, no, definitely. That's the impression I've, I get. I've never been to Texas. Mm. I've been to America, but I've never actually been to Texas. I would love to go. The pecan pie is amazing. <laughs> it is genuinely amazing. And uh, they are sort of uh, special in a few different ways, <clears throat> um, apart from being among the big, I mean, California is bigger, but other yeah. than that, Texas has got like a massive industry, massive oil industry, and there's all sorts of reasons why they're, just uh, among the premier states of America, you know. Um, uh, well, one of the reasons why they're really quite special, their history is a little bit special, is that they were entirely their own republic for a while. It wasn't like 10 years or something. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> they, they were independent. They basically managed to sh- uh, uh, win their independence from Mexico, mm. and then they were their own republic <clears throat> for quite a few years before they were annexed by the United States. Um uh, willingly they wanted to be right. uh, there was a small minority that didn't want to There's, there was a fair few actual people that wanted to remain as their own republic but most people wanted to be annexed by the United States and were so they're um, yeah they're, they're, they're a little bit special mm. um, okay so the story of their revolution so um, and, and the Alamo which is a famous last stand and there's something about last stands, aren't there? Yeah, uh, doomed romantic. last stand. They're exactly, exactly romantic. Yeah, like Rourke's Drift or Thermopylae or something. Um, uh, so, where to start? The the bit of land we now call Texas. The bit? It's massive. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's gigantic. <laughs> yeah, it's like bigger than all of France yeah, yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. It's massive. It's like the size of Western Europe. Yeah. It's absolutely gigantic. Where I mentioned like the skies are bigger and things. Mm. You know, deep in the heart of Texas. It's also totally it really flat. Is. As well. It really is. It's, uh, it's massive and flat. And so it's, you can see for miles. And it's, it's kind of intimidating, to be honest. I get a bit agoraphobic in America because everything is so wide. <laughs> it's just, I'm not used to it. Because obviously in England, everything's quite small and, and closely packed. And I'm used to like the, the sort of, almost the sort of comforting nature of things being closer to you. In America, everything's just miles away from everything else. And it mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense to me. 
Yeah, I mean, it's giant. It's so big that it's got uh, just really different terrain and things like the Gulf region on the Gulf of Mexico is quite different mm. to sort of the, the Northwest, which mm. is, you know, like the, there's prairie regions and East Texas is more heavily populated and there's massive rivers. Um, San Antonio River comes into this story a fair bit and that's one of the big rivers. But, mm. like you know, the Colorado, uh, it, it's a giant massive country of all sorts of different um, different things going on. When you get a piece of land that big, mm. It's not just going to be one thing. Um, and so the bit of land we now call Texas is, uh, well, to be fair, when you look at the map, it's sort of, um, it's not near the East Coast at all. No, no. And then when people, <coughs> um, uh, the first uh, frontiersmen sort of started heading, in a concerted effort, started heading mm. West, they went much more, on much more northernly routes. Mm into uh, places, modern places like Colorado or even yeah. more northern. like in, in, uh, yeah. yeah. So in any way, by the late 18th century, Texas was still hardly populated. Mm. Um, there were like a few thousand, well, the French tried to uh, settle it a bit in the 17th century and failed. It's quite hard. It's quite a hard terrain to mm. settle. It's not immediately very, very easy to settle. Yeah. So the French tried and failed. The Spanish tried and failed, essentially tried and failed. They set up um, various missions. Like, for example, down the San Antonio River, they set up five different missions where they literally build a little church. Yeah. They did this everywhere. Right. They tried to convert the native Indians to Catholicism. Which I'm sure they were just eager to do. Mm -hmm. It was mainly Apache land at that point. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's lots of different uh, Native American tribes settled in Texas, but that's after all sorts of displacements and things. Right. Originally, it was mainly the Apaches, but not only the Apaches. People that are into their Native American history will say that's very low resolution. There's actually, or even the Apaches is sort of a coverall term. There's loads of different types of, of tribe of people. But anyway, they won't actually, the Apaches don't really feature all that much in the story because even by this point even by sort of the 1830s they're sort of undeniably bested outgunned uh outclassed in terms of industry mm. in terms of firepower in terms of all sorts of things already by this point yeah um so yeah we won't really be mentioning the the first peoples all that much um so that land uh, if we go back to the age of Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase, which is 1803, and I've mm -hmm. mentioned the Louisiana Purchase a couple of times on Epochs. Um, <coughs> Probably the best deal in the history of deals. Unbelievable deal. Uh, the United States basically doubled its yeah. area. It Wasn't with it the Napoleon of a they pen. purchased off? Yeah. yeah. Because he needed money for a war. I wonder who he was fine with. So what happened where, where we did multi, uh, mm. two or was, was it even three epochs on the Peninsula War yeah. where Napoleon invades Spain? Um, well, when he did that and forced the Spanish crown to abdicate, mm. <laughs> the abdications of Bayonne, um, he sort of just, again, sort of at a stroke of a pen, got all the Spanish holdings mm. in what at that point they called Louisiana, which is nothing like the modern state of Louisiana. It's just this massive swathe. I'll put a map up. Yeah. It's just like a it's, third almost of the middle of America. Yeah, it goes right up into Canada as well. It's enormous. It's like everywhere that the French had set up a fort, basically, because, I mean, the, the, the place is essentially underpopulated. There's no one there. And so up various rivers and things like that, just going across the entire United States. I remember seeing a map of it a while ago thinking, Jesus Christ. Well, that's like the, the US being like, yeah, can we buy this off you? It's been brilliant. You know, how yeah. brilliant is this? People have said that's the best deal yeah. of all time. For the America. Uh, for yeah. America, yeah. <laughs> um, so Louisiana goes from, yeah, the Gulf of Mexico mm. all the way up sort of the Rockies, all the way up the middle of America, all the way up to Canada. Um, so when France and Napoleon got hold of it, mm. um, incidentally, the Spanish still held on to big parts of modern day Florida. But anyway, um, he realised that he couldn't hold it. He was the, he was in the middle of a, a skull crushing European twenty year European war. He couldn't. He didn't have the men to hold that remotely. And so, in order to 
prevent the British from just going in and taking it. Yeah. He thought, well, okay, just to prevent that, I'll 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 sell it to the Americans. <clears throat> Uh, Jefferson, President Jefferson, yep. 1803. And Jefferson's like, yes, please, he bit his hand off. It's like, yes, please. You got It's like a few dollars per square mile. Yeah, it's Crazy. amazing. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, and so, again, as I say, a stroke for pen, suddenly the United States is twice as big. But it didn't stretch all the way to the Pacific Ocean, hmm. though. No, no, no. So the far west, places like, you know, Montana, Oregon, um, California, all that sort mm. of thing, was still sort of completely still engine territory, you know. The, although the Spanish did lay claim to it all, uh, you, if you see a map of the Spanish Empire, you can see along the west coast of America they've claimed it. But like again, the same problem they, they're going to have the same problem Napoleon had. It's like, look, this is ten thousand miles away, and there's almost no one there. So that's a good point. They absolutely claimed it, but it was purely on paper. Yeah, yeah. purely on paper. Yeah, and in fact. Where the the line of the Louisiana Purchase, like the borders of where it ended and when it stopped, what exactly did Jefferson buy yeah, there? Who knows? It was never properly properly written in stone. <laughs> the French probably didn't even know, right? Yeah, but, you know, imagine being in Paris and being like, right, on the other side of the world, on a continent where there's hardly any people, we've got a line on a map. Jeez, mm. like, oh, what does that represent? <laughs> and sometimes they follow the rivers, so you yeah. can say that, but often not. Yeah. So it's like so. So anyway, you went from being, if you did happen to live out, if you, if you were one of the few um, European settlers in that part of the world, uh, you went from being a Spanish subject to a French citizen to an American citizen in the space of a few months mm. or like a month or something, very, very short. Napoleon sold it on really quick, really. Yeah. He needed the money. He needed to get rid of the headache and the money. A, I mean, tactically sound move. I can see why he did it. Right, yeah, What's yeah. the point in this? Yeah, uh, right. Absolutely right. From his from his point of view, everyone's a winner, really. Yeah. Apart from Britain, um, and that was sort of the point yeah. in all sorts of but ways. I mean, yeah. How did that work out for him? And so anyway, when Napoleon is eventually defeated at Waterloo, um, it sort of go back goes back by default to the Spanish Empire, the crumbling remnant of the Spanish Empire. Yeah. It sort of formally goes back to them, the parts of it, not not what um, Jefferson had bought, but all the places west of that. Yeah. And so exactly as we've said, what exactly did he bought? So big parts of what we now call Texas were sort of disputed. Did the Louisiana Purchase go up to this river or this river? Mm. And the Americans said, oh, it goes all the way up to the Rio Grande. Grande oh, Rio Grande. They say that? It goes all the way. So that's all ours now, right? And Spain was like, no, uh, no. Okay, but if, Spain can say no all they want, but it turns out the Spanish are horrible at war. A little bit. So, you know, you can say no, but the Americans have got English technology, English motivations, you know, they've got English institutions, which are a lot better at war. <laughs> and it's interesting, a lot of the uh, white American settlers into Texas are always called Anglos. Yeah. Um, and they're not always English. Sure. But- can be all sorts of things, quite a lot of Germans, actually, but it's Scottish, Irish... Yeah. Lots of English as well, but yeah. if you're sort of very white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, anything like that, they just you're just called an Anglo or a Texian. They get called mm. Texians. So the Spanish um, settlers, the Spanish Euro- uh, people of Spanish descent in Texas, um, uh, were called the uh, the t- the Tejanos, Tejanos, mm. and the whites, the pure whites, are mm. sort of called just always called Anglo's or, or te- Texians. Mm. Um, Okay, so that's is that where the name Texas comes from? Is it? Um, I don't know exactly. I guess I'm not sure exactly where the where the word Texas comes from. I'm not sure. Should probably know that. Um, (laughs) Anyway, the Um, etymology of most words is actually poorly known. I mean, no one really knows where the name America came from. They assume it was some Spanish explorer. Is is that not a definite thing? I thought I didn't think it was. I thought I thought it was um, just the most likely Amerigo. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have seen that, that people yeah. have said that, and then modern researchers said, is that right, though? Is that yeah. the case? So how did California get its name? No one's really sure. Because, mm, yeah. like, you know, when when these things are being discovered and first charted and settled, there's no bureaucracy overseeing any of this, you know? And so the, the, the colloquial name just be- comes out of the, the sort of the mire of people moving in and out and it just sticks. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.